Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. Our topic today is money and its influence. Of course, we know that money has a profound influence on all of us, including pastors, elders and leaders in churches. Our guest today is Pastor John Matthews. Pastor Matthews is the Director for Stewardship for all of the North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Matthews, welcome. Thank you. And thanks for coming on Ministry in Motion. You're welcome. Just talk to us a little about the, the history of the influence of, of money in our society. Our society today is what is called an experience economy. Everything's based on experience. How did we get here? When you went to grandma's house years ago, she made a cake for you for your birthday from scratch. That's with the agrarian economy. The next year she made it from a box that she got at the grocery store. That's the goods economy. Mm -hmm. The next year she says, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Let's just call the deli and get a cake from the grocery store. That's the service economy. Then the next year she says, I don't have time for any of this. Let's just go rent a whole chunky cheese restaurant. And that's known as the experience economy. And then young people today say, if uh, you don't have a picture and you can't upload it, it didn't happen. So oh. you have the social economy and then you have the flex economy, which includes everything. In other words, retailers are trying to push a rich lifestyle to those of us that live in an experience economy. Mm. So that's kind of how we've got here. Okay. Well, that does have a profound influence on all of us, doesn't it? Yes, it in, does. in how we spend our money, how we regard ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, at the world today, it's, it's changed dramatically. I think for a lot of us, our grandmothers, our grandfathers have seen that profound change. How would you describe the world today, the, the, the secular world and its use and management of money today? The world today, I believe, has passed a tipping point. The world today focuses on borrowing and spending where if you follow principles laid down in scripture, it says save and invest. So not only do we live in an experience economy, we live in what is called a postmodern world. And in a postmodern world, there's no absolutes, there's nothing objective, and everything is based on experience because postmodern philosophy rejects truth. So when it comes to money, I can believe whatever I want to believe. Mm. And uh, that's truth for me. And whatever you believe about money, that's truth for you. Nobody can tell us what to believe. That's our decision. And it's based on experience. And I don't like things based on my experience. I want something bigger than myself that I can sink my roots and foundation into that has some substance. I have some absolutes. One psychiatrist said, if you have a core identity and you have these absolutes, you're considered mentally ill. And it doesn't bother me really. I mean, uh, I don't mind being that at all uh, because I have uh, a principle that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I mean, that ought to be foundational. Mm, absolutely. In, in a world that's rejecting truth and this experience economy and, and, and the uh, postmodern world, just anything and everything goes. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the challenges that we do face is that when we bring up the topic of money, it's regarded as an intensely personal type thing. Mm -hmm. There's se several things that we don't talk about in public. Um, and one of the things that we typically don't discuss is our personal finances. Mm -hmm. What's your response to that, John? Well, personal finance is uh, exactly that. It's personal. Mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, a religious experience, my money is disconnected from my worship. And uh, it's part of me. When I work and I earn money, uh, researchers indicate that uh, that money is an extension of myself. It's part of my energy, part of my life. And uh, with retailers after our money through our emotions, uh, they are very sophisticated, very good at separating our money from us mm -hmm. based on experience. It's almost like uh, the world is fast moving to what I call materialism. Uh, money is the God of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is the church we gather in to worship. 
Uh, sensuality is the mysticism of materialism. Hoarding is the futility of materialism. Narcissism is materialism's mental disorder. Greed is what keeps us coming back. Television is the advertising arm of materialism. But guess what? Gratitude is the antidote for all of these influences of the world in, in such a postmodern culture. Hence, connected to Jesus Christ, enter tithe and offering. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about that. How, how is the giving of a, a donation or an offering, the returning of tithe, how is that the antidote? First of all, whenever I return tithe, that is a statement of faith. A lot of people do not want to talk about this. They say it's part of the Old Covenant. Uh, well, you have texts in the Old Testament that talk about debt. They never say that's part of the Old Covenant. So I believe as you take the Old Testament and the New Testament as a whole, just because one doesn't say much about uh, tithing doesn't mean you disregard the whole thing. Mm. So tithing is an antidote because it shows God, I'm honest, number one. Number two, you're God. Number three, you're the Redeemer. Number four, you're going to make the nine-tenths go further than the ten, and that is a statement of faith. In reality, it is a barometer of our salvation experience. The offering is also part of this system. You can't separate tithe and offering any more than you can separate a coin. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, they just go together. Offering speaks of my gratitude to God, and there's also what is called a gratitude test. When I have an offering that uh, I give, that says to, Lord, to the Lord how much I am grateful for. Yeah. Gratitude is such a powerful thing, isn't it? Yes. You, you know, when, when we realize that the money, it's, it isn't ours. Right. You, you know, it doesn't belong to us as individuals. It doesn't belong to uh, the, the world, the corporate world, not even to the church. Money, the whole deal of this planet belongs to God. And this is leading us to that fundamental point of stewardship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we've, we've covered a lot of material in this first section, <laughs> and I'd like to come back and explore some more details on money and its impact upon in, uh, individuals and the church and what we can do to counter that. So stay with us. We'll be right back with more of Ministry in Motion. <music> Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today is money and its influence. And our special guest is Pastor John Matthews. Pastor Matthews, there, there is an old saying that money is the God of this world. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we know that there is a, a, a great creator God, but there is this still God that in many respects doesn't breathe or sleep or live but has a huge controlling influence over us. Explore that a little more with us. Okay, first of all, Satan is the God of this world. But if he manifested himself in reality, we wouldn't go for it. Mm. So he has an allure, which is money. That's a mask he wears that he allures, in, allures us in. So that's why I call it the God of this world. And uh, whenever you start looking at money, uh, the scripture says you can't serve two masters. You've got to choose God or mammon or God or wealth. Mm. So if I choose God and I am struggling with my relationship with him, I may just exit. Uh, that's why I believe uh, when it comes to serving God or serving money, uh, if I have a relationship with the Lord, my happiness is going to precede my stewardship. Okay, so, let's just pause on that for a moment. So our happiness precedes stewardship. Un unpack that for us. If I am happy with you as my pastor, I'm going to come listen to you preach. If I am unhappy with you, I'm going to go hop to another church where I can get spiritually fed. Or if I don't like the way the local church is spending money, I may not want to give. If I am not happy with my relationship with Jesus or it's not working or I have doubts about him, why are you doing this? Why is this happening to me? My stewardship follows my happiness or unhappiness. Mm. So if I am not happy in a successful relationship, uh, 
it just colors everything that I do with stewardship because stewardship is where the rubber meets the road. That's yeah. what I do every day. That's my stewardship. I have a stewardship. Yeah. Now, with, with this influence of money, there, there is the influence upon those who have the money, the spenders, the, the keepers, those in possession of the money, but also those who are, in a sense, seeking it. And we as pastors, in a sense, when we preach, when we're leading a church, frequently we're in need of money. What's some of the influences that we need to be aware of as leaders of churches in our quest for funding? They've done some research and found that if I stand up and say the word money from the pulpit, people will exhibit materialistic tendencies, meaning I don't want to give up what's part of me. Mm -hmm. uh, they've also discovered that uh, if a church wants to have more money given, let the women take up the offering. Now, that goes back to a sensuality of materialism, you know, and, and, and you know, that's kind of a whole subject in itself, but uh, uh, we're, we're just a few steps behind what the, the rest of the Christian world is doing. We're trying to use all kinds of methods uh, to bring funds in, but the only reason for giving is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's the only reason. Exactly. And it's our task to present that. We've got to try to link that person's passion with their treasure. Mm. And, and we want them to follow that treasure uh, because they're going to follow it anyway. So why not have it put into the Lord's work? Yeah. John, are you familiar with somebody who's really had their life transformed as a result of making that ex journey and that experience in their own life? I was just out of seminary. I thought I knew all the answers. I discovered the church treasure didn't know how to do church books. And I thought, I've got to take these away from this person because I discovered that her husband was doing the, uh, the bookkeeping and he was not a member of the church. I was just distraught. I thought I can take the books away or give this guy Bible studies. So I said, I'll give Bible studies. He knew all the answers. I didn't have anything to do with it. His wife was the witness. Mm -hmm. The day came to ask him to be a member of the church and he was standing by his car and he started to weep and cry. He was old enough to be my father. I didn't know what to do with this. I'd get all wimpy out watching a Lassie movie. <laughs> but here this guy was crying and he said, John, I'll be baptized. Yeah. But I, he said, John, I wrote out my tithe check for the first time in years. I mean, there's something more going on than just a transaction. Well, after he was baptized, we made him the associate church treasurer. That makes sense. And uh, you, you could just see the smiles on his face and the smile on his wife's face. It was a transformation. It will kick up your spiritual life a notch. Yeah. Whenever you faithfully return tithe and give offerings, it has to do with gratitude. It has to do with that relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And he says, I don't need the money. I've designed this program to make you happy. Mm. Transformed lives and, and what happens with that, particularly when they start appreciating that the, the God of the universe rather than the paper God of, of this world. Yes. Yeah it's, yeah, it's a wonderful journey, isn't it? Yes, it is. Actually, money is what is called brain candy. You can't get enough of it. But just remember, it's an artificial sweetener. It doesn't last. It's a demigod. It's mm. got power, but it doesn't have ultimate power. Exactly. Yeah. Money and its power, money and its influence. That's our topic today on Ministry in Motion. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today is money and its influence. And our guest is Pastor John Matthews. John, let's just explore a little more how stewardship is the antidote to this God of, of money. Talk us through that. The way stewardship is the antidote for money is to understand what it is. Uh, for me, I think of the old wagon wheel ruts on the Oregon Trail. When I was pastoring in Nebraska, I could go out and look at these ruts. You can still see them. So you have this old wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. The hub is Jesus Christ. 
The spokes on the wagon wheel are the beliefs and values that we have. In other words, the Ten Commandments, salvation in Christ, what happens to a person when they die, the 2300 days, all those different values that we have. The good things that radiate out from Jesus. They radiate out from Jesus, radiate out from Jesus. Then the outside rim, there's an old English word called fellow. It's made up of a number of pieces of wood and they cut it into a circle. They join the, the spokes uh, to that rim. I call that the three angels message. So you have in our unique teaching and philosophy, you have the hub, our values, the three angels message. And then on the outside, you have a steel tire. The Romans figured out that if they put a steel or iron tire on their wooden fellow, it would last longer. That steel tire is what I call stewardship. Or theologically, it is practical sanctification. It's taking all the things that I do, my daily living, my relationships, the things I buy, the things I sell, and connecting them to the hub. If it's not connected to the hub, I'm just on my own. Okay. And it sounds like that, that tire, that metal tire, would keep it bound together it, and protect it. It would, yeah. yeah. And if that tire gets loose, the wheelwright has to reset it. Mm. And he'll hit it with a hammer, and it's known as a ball-peen hammer. Because mm -hmm. when he hits that tire, it's called peening, peening. And so that's where we have the ball pin hammer from. Okay. I'd like to think Christ is the major wheelwright. Mm. And sometimes he has to reset my stewardship. Right, okay. Resets my life. So, and, and stewardship in this context is the recognition, I presume, that we are stewards of what God entrusts to us. Yes. Rather than owners of it. Um, and our responsibility is to manage, to care, to tend, and, and to gr grow. Both tangible and intangible possessions. Okay. So stewardship is not dealing with just money. That's a very tangible part. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a stewardship of relationships. There's a stewardship of a marriage. You know, go out and buy some strawberries dipped in chocolate, set those on the table when your wife comes home. I mean, that's payday. That's putting money in the bank. That's stewardship. It's cheaper than a divorce okay. as well. Okay. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. So, and, and these types of things is, as you describe it in that illustration of the, the tire on the wheel, that's really what we, we meet in our day-to-day -day experience, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. I've heard some people say stewardship is foundational. We might be playing with words, but I like to say Everything is centered in Jesus. Stewardship is centered in Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Everything I do is so centered in Jesus. He, without doubt, he is the hub. He's the hub. Yeah. And the wheelwright. Right. He's everything. Yeah. yeah. He's the ultimate steward. Okay. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> with, with this stewardship, not only are individuals entrusted with, with the tangibles and the intangibles, but the church is too. Talk to us a little bit more about that. The spirit of prophecy says that uh, God has entrusted to his church a sacred truth and we're to manage it. It doesn't make us better than anybody else, but it's a sacred truth we are to manage. I think of the uh, phrase Martin Luther said, there are three conversions, the heart, the mind, and the purse. We know what the heart is. We know what the mind is. What is a conversion of the purse? When I was a little boy, sitting at the dinner table one Sabbath, my dad, who was a pastor, he said, Johnny, did you see the man I baptized today? I said, yeah, dad. He said, when he walked out of the baptistry, he turned around and said, hey, preacher, the water didn't hurt my money. And my dad says, what are you talking about? And he dug through the wet, soggy robe and said, look here, preacher. Here's my billfold. The water didn't hurt my money. So he took the money down into the... Took the money down into the baptistry. And my dad says, why did you do that? He said, I wanted my money converted. That was a seminary class before I ever grew up. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you think he meant by that? What do you think he was looking to do with that? I believe that this gentleman had a pretty deep understanding of the material possessions, and this has been many years ago, mm. uh, and, and he wanted to give everything he had to God, not only his heart, mind, and purse. They probably had never heard of the quote from Martin Luther, 
but he wanted to give everything to him. Yeah. And he probably understood. He, who knows? He may have had an issue over money. And he said, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. Yeah, yeah. That's a powerful insight from Martin Luther all those years ago, yes. wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Conversion of the, the mind, the heart and the purse. Yes. And although it's centuries old, yes. it's still incredibly, incredibly relevant today, yes. particularly as our world has changed and, and the place of money hasn't decreased in any way and yes. that God has become all the more powerful. You got time for one more story? Sure. I get so excited about this, I almost can dance. Okay. But uh, uh, I was driving down the road, I had $100 bills in my hand and I was fanning and I had $2,000 and I couldn't wait to spend it. And the Lord spoke to me and said, John, I want you to invest in something you cannot see. Okay, end of discussion. What is it, Lord? He said, I want you to buy a one day church. You can have $500, I want $1,500. I said to him, can I keep fanning with this until I get home? <laughs> he said, that's all right. So I bought a church. I've never seen it, I've seen pictures. Mm -hmm. But on the way home, I had tears coming out of my eyes. Yeah. The only other person that I know of that had tears in their eyes from a gift was a widow that gave everything she had. Yeah. That's worship. Mm. That's stewardship. That's transformation. If we can get a person's emotional life tuned to their treasure and let God impress them what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. Powerful story. Thanks, John. Yeah. And we want to thank you for joining us on Ministry in Motion today as well, where our topic has been money and its influence. I'd like to invite you to visit our website. Our website, which is ministryinmotion.tv. There you can find an array of all the programs that we've ever put together on Ministry in Motion. There is almost 100 programs there for you to enjoy. And you can enjoy those Anytime, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I know a lot of pastors are using these in training uh, for their, the disciples in their church, members in their church, attendees, training them for ministry and practical things in ministry as well. There's one other thing I'd like to offer our viewers today as I reach forward. Here, I'd like to just remind you of Ministry Magazine. Ministry Magazine is a journal that's published regularly and we'd like to make this available to pastors. If you're a pastor and you're not receiving Ministry Magazine, we'd like to invite you to send us an email, feedback at ministryinmotion.tv. Send us an email and tell us about your ministry, what you're doing, your church. We'd love to hear from you. And we'd love to consider you for a complimentary subscription to this fine, professional, practical journal. Ministry in, in Motion works together closely with Ministry, the Journal, and Ministry, the Journal's been here since 1928. Well, we hope you've enjoyed today's program, and we look forward to your company on the next Ministry in Motion.